Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Hyundai and Kia Lambda 2 engine and how it works. Now the Lambda 2 is a V6 all aluminum engine, comes in different configurations. This one here is for the front wheel drive Kia Sedona, but you can also get it for the old Hyundai Genesis and rear wheel drive format. In fact, they're still using these in the new Hyundai Palisade and Kia Telluride. Taking a quick look around here, you'll see we have a metal timing cover at the front here, which is great. You've got an externally replaceable water pump, it's not driven by the chain inside. You have these plastic idler pulleys, and some configurations this comes with dual variable valve timing on both the intake and the exhaust side. Now coming around the back you see we have the oil filter and a plastic housing which I don't really like. At the top here you see we have plastic fuel rails. Now this is just a port injected older version. The newer versions will use direct injection only. Alright I'm going to start tearing down this engine by removing all these 10 millimeter bolts that hold on the rear valve cover. Go ahead and pop this off. That's pretty easy. You see the inside has been definitely resealed before with RTV. Yeah, so judging by the amount of RTV on here all over these cam gears I'm pretty sure someone's been here before and there's probably RTV in the sump that's not good we use too much guys next up I'm going to remove this variable valve timing solenoid this thing has a similarity to a Toyota to be honest it's got a cam on bucket design over here and it's got a one piece intake that just comes out with these plastic fuel rails anybody see any other similarities all right next up I'm going to pull the fuel rail off Plastic fuel rails. I don't like these. Next up, I'm going to remove the lower air intake plenum. There's a bunch of 6mm hexes here. All right, let's see if we can get this up. Inside of here, there's a coolant crossover tube. It's made of plastic, which is kind of good because it's better than rubber, but it's kind of bad because it's still plastic and it could age over time. Look at that. This is actually made of metal. Toyota should learn a lesson there. These are made of metal, nice and strong and a lot better than crumbly rubber. Now while it's great that the oil filter is nice and top and easily accessible, when you're changing your oil, you want the oil to drip downwards, not from the top downwards and cover the entire transmission. So I don't really like this style of filter. It's also all made of plastic, which is very easy to crack, especially with the heat cycling. At least you don't need any special tools for this. Just a giant socket. This is a cartridge style oil filter. No surprise, it actually looks pretty clean. I don't see any junk in here. Next up, I'm going to remove all the tens holding this to the block. Not much of a mess. Next up, I'm going to work on removing all the bolts that hold the front valve cover on. Well, that was easy. Once again, there's some illegal RTV here. But the valve cover gasket actually seems pretty pliable. Looking under here, I don't see any milky residue or anything like that indicating the head gasket failure. However, I did see some milk down in the oil pan when I was draining it. It had 190,000 kilometers on it. I'm going to remove this oil control valve next. Everything seems very watery. Check out this oil dripping over here. It seems like super watery or it's like brand new. All right, next up, I'm going to turn my attention to the front of the engine here where we have the timing cover and the water pump. I'm going to remove all these tens and twelves that go around here. Looks like there's some illegal bolts in here. Something doesn't look right with the way this matches up. Probably have the wrong pump in here. Maybe that's why it overheated. And for whatever reason, there's a six mil hex here. All right, this engine probably still has coolant inside. And there's the water pump. It's got a really interesting shape to it with a nice tip over here. Definitely looks pretty nasty in here. Someone's run something through the cooling system. Plus there's a lot of this gray RTV in here. I wonder if the water pump blew or it was leaking. I tried to seal it up and then that's what caused it to overheat. All right, now at the bottom here I have a 12. And now there's a 17. That takes off your tensioner. Now I spy with my little eye a lot of RTV going around this timing cover so I can bet you that's probably been resealed at some point too. Luckily this timing cover doesn't require you to drop the oil pan in order to get it off. It's just a couple of oil pan bolts that go through it so we'll take those out and then get all the 12 millimeters going around here. I cheated to knock this bolt loose before I put this thing on the stand. Here I'm going to remove these oil pan bolts. It's interesting how they have hubcaps for these things now. Let's see if this is reverse threaded or not. Nope. And I'll just grab this bolt that was hiding here. Alrighty, hopefully I have most of the bolts out. Let's give it a pry. There we go. And that's the timing cover. Now this looks pretty tarnished compared to the top. And here we have a look inside the timing cover of a Lambda 2 engine. It actually is pretty simple. It does have three timing chains. So you got one setup going to the cams of the front bank and one for the rear bank. And there's a small chain down at the bottom here for the oil pump. They each have only two slides, one here and one for the tensioner side with just two hydraulic tensioners. I also like how they have separate chains for each bank rather than having one chain going across and then having smaller chains power the exhaust side. I think Hyundai is just using the philosophy of keeping it simple. I just hope that the material choices that 
they do here actually hold up over time. All right, let me see if I can knock these cams loose while there's still tension on the chain. Okay, we're gonna take off these tensioners. You can see this is a hydraulic tensioner. That's why there's oil coming out of it. All in here, gonna knock this guy off. Here's the other tensioner. Slide this guide off here. Now this guide on this side is made of plastic. Same thing over here. This one's also made of plastic. So we'll pop the chain off on this side here. Leave that to dangle. Oh, cam jump. Pop the chain off on this side. And we'll grab the slide on this side. Now the slide on the back slide is actually made of metal with just a plastic sliding interface where the chain sits. This one's also made of metal. I got the first chain off. It's actually a pretty thin chain. The second one's connected to the oil pump. Now these Lambda engines use a pretty simple valve train setup. There's no rocker arms or anything like that. Just a simple cam cap that covers the camshaft. And the camshaft's lobes act down on a bucket which presses down the valve. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove that camshaft by taking out all these tens. Just lift this little cradle up. And then now I can remove the exhaust side camshaft. It actually looks in pretty good shape. There's not too many lines or anything. The bearing surfaces are pretty clean. Same thing on the intake side, things look pretty clean. Now the head bolts on these are a 12 point, 12 millimeter socket. It's actually surprising you don't need a special tool for this. All right, I'm gonna run these bolts up. All right, so just underneath this bracket, there's actually an extra bolt here. I'm gonna remove this bracket. Little head bolt. All right, so now I should be able to get the head off. It's rusty. Taking a look inside of the engine, you can see this one's filled with water. Remember this air intake was open to the elements and this one is full of rust. However, I did notice that these two head bolts here were a tad on the looser side and that probably contributed to the head gasket leaking. Now this is the head gasket that came off of here. So you can see here, this has basically been steam cleaned by all the coolant entering here and that's why this piston is a lot cleaner than the other two that has carbon buildup. There's also a slight ridge of clean piston up at the top here. Either that piston whacked the top of the head or there's some other thing going on there. All right, now we're over here on the front bank. We're going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold the cap caps on. There's like no wear in here. It's pretty nice. Now I'll remove this exhaust side camshaft. Okay, this one's got a little bit of scoring over here actually. Compared to the other side. Remove the intake camshaft. This one's actually okay. All in all, this engine doesn't look too weary. I'm going to go ahead and remove these head bolts. This stick looks like it's going to be in the way. Ah! Alright, I'm going to run these down. I can lift off this head. Oh, there's water on me. That's a piston in that water. Lots of water in that cylinder. At least you know that it holds water and it's not completely cracked and broken. The other two look pretty normal. So I think the back was the one that had the blown head gasket. Just gonna pop this little collar over here. Just so that you know, this is where the coolant temperature sensor is located. So you pretty much have to come all the way in here if you needed to change it or diagnose something. There's also a PCV passage in here. And of course, like most engines, you got two knock sensors in between the valley. Pop that off. Next, I need to rotate this engine. All I have today is the wife's dress to put on the ground. I don't really have anything else. Oh. Great, so the oily mess actually landed on the opposite side here. However, take a look at that. It's actually pretty milky and watery. So it's actually water and coolant mixed with oil. That indicates a big time head gasket leak. Now the lower oil pan is made of stamped steel. So we're gonna go ahead and remove these tens. Bet you it's all full of RTV. Boy, oh boy, look at that oil pan. It's just full of milky stuff. Now coolant doesn't do a very good job at lubricating things and oil doesn't do as good a job at cooling things. So that's why you never wanna have these two mixed inside of your engine. Because it had a blown head gasket, that's definitely why these mix together. Surprisingly, this is actually a pretty common sight on these Lambda 2 engines. They're known to overheat and they burn oil. Looking inside of the oil screen, I don't see any particles or anything blocking it, so it probably wasn't oil starved. We do have this oil pump, which is driven by the crankshaft chain over here. I got a couple of bolts. This here is the actual tensioner. I'm gonna remove next. See the spring? This is a plastic chain guide. Take off this little hat here. I'm gonna remove this 12. Pop this guy off. Then I can also pop this gear off the crankshaft. Luckily it's actually keyed. And then finally this gear over here. And the final timing chain. Next I'm gonna remove this oil pump from the upper oil pan. If we should take this thing apart. All right, next up we have the upper oil pan, which is made of some kind of aluminum or magnesium alloy. It's held in by a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts. Let's pop this off. Now check it out. You can see there's actually some small cracks on this oil pan over here. And it's just an oily, milky mess underneath. Now taking a look under here, you can see we do have this metal oil baffle. Nice to see that there's still metal and not plastic yet. Let's 
pop that off. It's dirty here, clean here. All right, taking a look under here, you can see very simple V6 crankshaft. I kind of like this engine. So far, it's been pretty nice to me to take apart. Now, these are 10 millimeter, 12 point sockets holding connecting rods on. So I'm gonna bust those free. Connecting rod caps are good. There's the bearing, nice and clean. There's a bit of scoring on that one. Push out these pistons here. All right, let's get the next two pistons. This piston out of here. All right, let's get the back two pistons out. This one's clean. Without all those rusty pistons in here, we got a nice smooth rotating assembly. So the first two pistons had the worst connecting rod bearings. There's just some minor scoring, nothing major, catastrophic. Next up, we got 12 millimeter, 12 point sockets holding all the main cap bearings in. So there's four bolts going downward and two bolts going on the side, which make this thing pretty rigid. I do like that I don't need any special tools for this one. They're tighter than the head bolts. Let's get the ones on the side here. I'm gonna zip these off. I don't know about you, but I kind of hate this part. Getting the main caps out. Always got to make sure you get these bolts before you mount it to the stand. All right, now I'm going to remove the crankshaft. And finally, I can remove the block from the stand. It's actually pretty light for a V6. All right, so here we've got the engine all taken apart here. Let's take a quick look at how this works. Now we're gonna start here at the lower and the upper oil pan. Now, mechanically speaking, they really don't have much significance other than to hold the lower end of the engine together. Now the oil pump itself will mount to the bottom of this upper oil pan like this, and it's gonna provide fluid flow through this little hole directly into the block. I'm just gonna open this up. There you go. Now you can see it's a vein style oil pump. So as this rotates here with the chain moving from the crankshaft, it's going to provide that fluid flow by allowing oil to move in between those pockets. Now this is actually a variable oil pump. So let's say your RPMs increase and this thing starts to push a lot of oil pressure. You don't really need all that oil pressure. So this spring here is actually going to start to compress, which is going to turn this housing and that's going to reduce the big pockets that you have inside of here. So it's going to become a lot smaller, which means that it's not going to be able to push as much oil, especially when you're at that high RPM. So it's kind of a mechanically adjusting variable oil pump. We're taking a look at the Lambda 2 engine block. You see that oil flow is then going to be sent down into the block, into this large oil gallery over here. And eventually it's going to make its way through these little pipes to the middle point over here where it's going to be sent through a gallery that runs the length of the block towards the back for the filter. Now what's cool is it's got this little pipe here joining these two sockets together, which is what held the hydraulically activated timing chain tensioners. And you can see that was actually powered off of the middle oil galley over here, which runs also along the length of the block. Looking around the top of the block here, you can see this is where that oil galley is going to supply oil to the oil filter, which was mounted here. And then through this hole, it's going to release the oil back into the oil gallery down below this one, which is going to run back to the front of the engine. So here's like a side view version of that. You can see how that oil is going to be sent back down to that center gallery, where you can see down right to the front of the engine. Also cool to note is that they don't use the word lambda 2. They actually use the Greek letter lambda. Now looking inside the V of the block where that oil gallery will run, you can see the sprayers here will tap off that and it's going to spray the inside of the cylinders with oil to lubricate it. And you've also got these holes here for the crankshaft, which are also going to tap into that oil gallery. Overall, I'm liking the very simplistic nature of this engine. I just found this thing a little awkward though. What if this pipe starts to get a little sludge inside of there? Then this tensioner is going to get starved of oil and skip timing. Now the cooling system on this V6 Lambda 2 is very simple. Just an open deck design where you got a cooling jacket going all the way around. There isn't even a coolant drain or anything. It just takes all of that water or coolant from the water pump, which is situated at the front of the block over here. Now this engine wasn't really known for its super reliability. We did have issues with overheating, as you saw in this case, and also oil burning. Now up at the top here, you can see these two oil feeds that are gonna go to the head to feed the two heads for lubrication and variable valve timing. Now before we move to the head, let's take a look at these pistons. You'll see that there's a normal amount of carbon buildup on them like any other engine and the front pistons all look normal. Now the rear pistons here, while well, there was some water sitting, that's why this one's pretty rusty. This is the one here that had the blown head gasket. You can see all that carbon's been steam cleaned off of it. And this is the rear one over here. Now like all modern engines, the oil control ring, which is this third one at the bottom here, is pretty thin. You can see this one is actually not clogged. But if they do get clogged up, and especially these holes, then all that oil that's on the cylinder wall is going to end up on top of the piston and get burned. And that's how you end up burning oil. 
Is that any surprise from a Kia or a Hyundai? Taking a look at the top of the head here, you can see this uses a very simple cam bucket design. Now that means that the oil isn't controlling the lash. You're actually going to have to do a valve adjustment on these once in a while. And you do that by actually replacing the buckets or putting shims under here. Now the fact that all of these look brand new to me means that definitely this engine looks like it's been opened up before, especially given all that RTV that we found in here. Over here you can see the holes for the variable valve timing system that's going to control those cam phasers we saw earlier. Now looking down inside of there you can see that the back of the valves are actually pretty clean and that's because this is just a port injected engine. The newer engines come with gasoline direct injection which means that you will have to remove the intake and do a periodic cleanup inside of here because these valves get clogged up with carbon. There's no gasoline to wash it off so it's nice and shiny like you see here. Now as I turn this over we're going to make a mess with all the buckets coming out. Now the gasket from the rear head, which is supposedly blown, probably is original. It's completely coated in the black car graphite or carbon stuff. Whereas the front one pretty much looks brand new, so maybe they replaced the front one. And I noticed that this is also for a 3.3 liter. I wonder if it's the same for this 3.5 or they put the wrong gasket on. Sometimes I find it interesting to uncover tracks on what other people have done or past repairs. Look at that exhaust valve, it's burnt up. Yeah, having white exhaust valves is not really a good thing. There's so much crust built up on them. Now, there's not too much else to see on this head here other than the fact that the variable valve timing solenoid is located in between the bank where the air intake is. So it's a little poopy to get that out. Whereas the other one was located right on top of the valve cover that sat over here for the exhaust side. Now oil from the engine block is actually going to travel up inside of here. You can see that there's a gallery that's going to tee off and go to the variable valve timing solenoid for the intake side. Now for the exhaust side it's going to tee off to go to the variable valve timing solenoid that sat up top here for that exhaust side. So this basically has dual variable valve time. You also notice there's a little ball pressed in here and here and that's because there's a galley that runs the length of the head going down this way and that way to lubricate the camshafts. Now the oil galley runs along the head over here and you can see the little holes here that are tapped into it in order to lubricate those cam bearings. Now for the exhaust cam bearings the oil galley runs inside of here and you can see that the cam cap that would sit here has this little extra lobe on it and that's going to carry the oil from that in order to lubricate this bearing. Now here's a look under the head that supposedly has a head gasket issue. You can see it's kind of got this line in this region over here. Supposedly where that coolant from these jackets over here were leaking into the combustion chamber causing that steam cleaning. And you can see that also on the piston that sort of this half here here has more of that steam cleaning. And that's a look at Hyundai's Lambda 2 engine and how it works. Supposedly this engine isn't plagued as much as the Theta 2 engines were with the oil consumption and blowing up issues, but they still do have their problems. Now overall I think the Lambda 2 engine, from a design perspective, is actually a pretty simple... Oh, thanks. Make sure you guys subscribe to my wife's channel. She makes some really good stuff. Now it's important to note that these Lambda engines are probably going to be replaced by some two or three cylinder or a turbocharged bicycle or something in the future just due to emissions. At least these Lambda 2 engines were not plagued with as much issues as the Theta 2 engines were. Now check my link above if you want to check that one out because those are catastrophic. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.